Welcome to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where we feature top leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry with your host, Drew Hendricks. Now, let's get started with the show. All right, today is a little different. We have two hosts, and this episode will go live on Inspired Insider. It will also go live on Legends Behind the Craft. I'm Dr. Jeremy Weiss. I'm the founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. I'm here with Drew Hendricks. Drew? Drew Hendricks here. I'm the host of the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where I talk with leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry. And we will formally introduce today's guest in a moment, Michael Houlihan, who founded Barefoot Wines. And it's an iconic brand. I'm sure you've seen it in every single store, grocery store you've been in. Um, We always like to point out, Michael, a few cool episodes, other episodes people should check out. Um, I had an episode with the founder of Wild Tonic, Holly Lyman, who I basically told also your book, Michael, is a must read for her and anyone in general, entrepreneur, or anyone, especially in the beverage space, especially in the wine space, the co-founder of Pixar, uh, Alvy Ray Smith, and many more. And Drew, what are a few of yours people should check out? A few of the latest ones that people should really check out is we talked with Joe Wagner from Copper Cane Wines and Provisions about his kind of exit from Naomi and into his new ventures up and down the West Coast. And then Paul Mabry, who's just founding a new venture, Picks Wines. And then Joe Fatterini is a, a must a must see where you've got a where he's the host of the wine show. Cool. Um, this episode is brought to you by Rise Twenty Five, and at Rise Twenty Five, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream One Hundred relationships, and we do that by helping you run your podcast. You know, Michael, for me, and also for Drew, the number one thing in our lives are relationships, and we always look at ways to give to our relationships. And I have found no better way over the past ten years then to have them on my podcast, shout from the rooftops, what they're doing and the things that I admire about them and their company. So if you have questions, you can go to rise25.com. And Drew? In today's episode, it's also sponsored by Barrels Ahead. At Barrels Ahead, we work with you to implement a -a one-of-a-kind marketing strategy when that highlights your authenticity, tells your story, and connects you with your ideal customers. Cool. Go to barrelsahead.com today to learn more. Awesome. And a big thank you to Ryan Folland. This wouldn't happen without Ryan Folland. And Ryan Folland wrote Ditch the Act and can be found on ryan.online. And I know Michael knows him well. And it's our pleasure to introduce the founder of the iconic Barefoot Wine brand. Eventually, that was acquired by Gallo, Michael Houlihan. Michael and his partner, Bonnie Harvey, co-authored the New York Times bestselling business book, The Barefoot Spirit. And it's how hardship, hustle, and Heart built America's number one wine brand. And it chronicles their humble beginnings in a laundry room that created and eventually created an international best-selling wine brand. And their latest venture is businessaudiotheater.com. You should check it out. Uh, It performs founder stories in an audiobook format to improve employee acquisition, engagement, and tenure. You can also learn more at thebarefootspirit.com. And Drew and I were talking about how drew what was your thought on the book that you you know michael uh michael's like say that again we got to say that again for the audio your well, experience a, with the book. It, was, it was a whole nother level it took i read the book but then listening to the audio it was a completely immersive experience it was about you were brought into it like a movie so right we try to try to bring it to life true absolutely you, you succeeded thank you So, Michael, this is where we stop talking and you talk the rest of the time and we want to hear from you. So I want to start with and we'll we'll dive into why you created the book, how you created the book and business audio theater. But I want to start with taking us back to, as you say, in the the uh, subtitle, which is, you know, the humble beginnings and um, take us back to a few of the hardest times in your journey what time sticks out to you oh boy well they they all stick out you know i'm i'm laughing now but i was crying then um you know it's it's really uh quite a challenge to jump into an industry uh that you know very little about uh and i probably wouldn't have chose to do that um but i had such an opportunity laid in my lap 
uh, I just couldn't walk away from it. So uh, my partner, Bonnie, who I'd only known for a year, came to me one day and she said, you know, she says, my client is a grape grower and he's owed for three years worth of crops from this winery that hasn't paid him a dime. Maybe you can go talk to him. And she knew that I used to work for the federal government and uh, as, as, a, as a business advisor and what have you for HUD and uh, SBA and what have you. And I thought, you know, gee, I just met this gal and she's got me out, you know, collecting money already, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and it was 300 large too. It wasn't a small bill, even in those days. And I had to go to the winery, you know, hat in hand and see what I could get. And as I got there, the guard at the door said, well, I hope you're not here to collect any money because uh, you got to take a ticket and wait your turn, pal, just like the rest of us. I said, what are you talking about? He says, oh, we just declared a chapter 11 bankruptcy this morning. Mm. And I went, oh my God, you know, I'm not going to collect any money here. But I went through with the meeting anyway. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, the meeting was made up of, of the secured stock, the secured debtors. They were now, they were now on the board of directors of this bankrupt company. And um, I looked out the window and I saw this row of tanks. And I just decided to, you know, break the ice. And I said, well, what's what's in those tanks anyway? And they said, oh, well, that's Cabernet Sauvignon and Sauvignon Blanc in bulk wine, thousands and thousands of gallons. I thought to myself, you know, that's funny. Those are the same two varietals that Bonnie's client, the grower, sold these guys. And they made wine out of it and they can't pay him. And then I looked out this other window and boy, it looked like some kind of a handball court, you know, with a big uh, chrome locomotive in it. And I said, what's with the handball court and the chrome locomotive over here? And they said, oh, no, that's 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 a bottling line. That's a Crohn's bottling line. It does 3000 cases a day. You know, it's this, it's that. And uh, so, you know, we had broken the ice. And then as we're talking, I realized that I'm not going to get paid any money for this. But then I get hit like a chrome locomotive with this idea. And I said, well, all right, so you guys can't pay us any money, but what would you say to a trade? What if you gave us goods and services, which is bulk wine and bottling services in lieu of cash, and we scrub the debt? And so that, that really appealed to them because they wanted to use their line anyway. And uh, it was a way for them to improve their cash position. And so here, you know, I'd gone in there to collect money for my girlfriend, <laughs> for her client. And I walk out with a, a contract for $300,000 worth of goods and services. Well, that's all fine and dandy, you know, if you have a label, you know, if you understand distribution, if you understand, you know, the state by state compliance laws, uh, you know, if you can understand packaging and all this stuff, not not to mention a marketing program and, and a catchphrase and all that. And uh, I thought, well, you know, what we got is better than a stick in the eye. And how hard can that other stuff be? Right? <laughs> <laughs> Famous last words, right? Yeah. And I mean, it was a wake up call for the first four or five years. And uh, the thing is that Bonnie and I were both consultants in different uh, realms of life. She helped people organize their offices and oversee their expenditures. And I helped people expand their businesses and deal with the government because I had government background, you know, get loans and what have you, split their property, think whatever they needed to do with the government. I was good with that. And so we combined our talents and we went about this adventure, which was really an entrepreneurial adventure, you know, uh, taking notes. And I think that that's what saved us. You know, we basically didn't make the same mistake more than twice. You know, <laughs> we'd say, hey, didn't we do this before? You know, and uh, so uh, I guess one of the most uh, uh, humbling experiences is having that much equity in an industry and not knowing how to monetize it. And so I went out and I started asking everybody I could think of, you know, I mean, I'm not a professional in this industry. So I just did the common sense thing. I went out and I asked buyers, I asked clerks, I asked people that were driving truck, you know, I asked people that had anything to do with the industry. What's missing in the industry? What does the industry need? 
you know, what do you think the best access to market is today? And they told me, they all told me, I, 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 I took lots of notes and, and I, I wound up with a plan, which was, which was interesting. They were all very happy. And I tell my clients today, be sure to ask people in your industry at every level what they think. Most of them have never been asked. And they'll be really happy to tell you what they really think. And these are the people, you know, we say make friends with people in low places, you know, dirt under the fingernails. They're doing the real work. Well, a guy, a guy who runs a bottling line will tell you what sells and what doesn't because he's got a whole room full of labels there. And some of them are moving and some of them aren't. And the ones that aren't, you don't want to be that guy, see? And so um, that that's kind of the way that we learned uh, got a marketing education, you know. So one of the guys I went to, uh, which is interesting, is played in the audio book by uh, Ed Asner, who just passed away, a great, a great actor. You know, he did Up and, and all of that other stuff as like a 50 year career. And uh, he, he wanted to work with us. So, I, you know, he, he's a snarky guy anyway. And so the snarkiest guy that I could think of that in my history was this guy who was the buyer for Lucky Star, uh, Lucky Stores in California, which was a big chain store at the time. They had about uh, 400 stores, you know, 200 Northern California, 207. And I thought, well, I'll just go ask him, you know, what he wants. And then we'll design it for him. And I, I love it. That's great. Yeah. And he was like, he was blown away that anybody from the wine industry would actually ask, you know, a guy in a warehouse who was a buyer, you know, what he wanted. <laughs> mm-hmm. And he told me, and what he told me was just crazy. You know, he says, well, he says, uh, you know, I don't have all day, Houlihan, you're taking up my time. You're not selling me anything. I'm not buying anything from you. So here it is. He says, get out a pencil. And I did. And he says, Listen, he says, I want a salt and pepper act. I want it better than Bob. I want it cheaper than Bob. And I want you to put it in a pig. You got that? And I'm writing this all down. And I don't know what the hell it means. <laughs> I have no idea. He says, can you do that? And I said, yeah, I can do it. And so I started out the door. And he goes, and one more thing, Houlihan. He says, that label. He says, don't make it a hill or a leap or a valley. Don't put it in French. Don't put a chateau or a castle on it. He says, I've got too many of those. I can't sell. He says, make the name the same as the logo and make it visible from four feet away so she can see it when she's pushing her cart and get the hell out of here. (laughs) And so I'm writing this stuff down. I get back to my car and I'm going, I don't know. I think I just got a college education, you know, in wine merchandising. Um, so I had to go to my friend to translate it. And he said, oh yeah, he says, salt and pepper act. He says, that's red and white wine uh, from the same label. Uh, he says, Bob, he says, you know, Bob, he says, that's Robert Mondavi. And I'm thinking I got to be better and cheaper than Robert Mondavi. This is a good, Mm -hmm. good call. And I said, pray tell me what is a pig? He says, oh, a pig. He says, that's the big fat bottle of wine, the 1.5. You know, that's the, that's the magnum. It's twice the size of the 750, also known as a fifth. It's a pig. And I went, okay, he wants a 1.5 liter. He wants a red and white. And he wants it about the same price as the Mandavi red and white. So I knew where access to market was. And I'm telling you, most of my clients, they don't. They think that that the market is going to buy their idea. And, you know, I was a little bit like that myself for about five years. I was beating up the clients and saying, you know, you got to buy this. It's a gold medal winner. You know, it's this and that. Uh, And I had no idea uh, that 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 pitch was not going to work. So I put it all together. Uh, By the way, uh, we have a clip on that scene that I just uh, that I just described, and your listeners will enjoy it from uh, the Barefoot Spirit uh, Business Audio Theater. So uh, then, and another clip right after that, which is the, which is the really humiliating part of my journey. Uh, so I do it exactly like he says. You know, I put in a pig. You know, I got it. It's, it's about as good as Bob, and it's it's cheaper than Bob. Uh, and uh, you know, it's uh, a salt and pepper act. You know, red and white. And, um, you know, I, I put it down on his desk and he, he picks it up. He looks at it and he shakes his head and he goes, are you crazy? He says, I can't sell this. He says, 
nobody ever heard of Barefoot. You know, I'm not going to put this in my stores. He says, you know, he, he kind of looked at me like I was out of my mind. And uh, I said, well, you know, we bottled it all up for you. What am I going to do now? <laughs> and he says, well, he says, I guess you got to go sell it to every mama, pop in every corner grocery store and every independent because the big box stores and the chains are not going to touch it because nobody's ever heard of Barefoot. You got to make it a household word. I said, you know, that's going to take years. He says, that's right. You better get started. <laughs> love that um that audio that that audio part there brought yeah. me back to I, I got my my start in the wine industry as a wine buyer in san francisco in the early 90s so that whole ed asner um snarkiness just brought me right back to 30 years ago when we were when i was buying the wine and then with wilford wong and the ashbury market it was it just painted such a vivid story of your challenges and how you overcame them thank you as a matter of fact uh Wolford was one of the first buyers in San Francisco who said, you know, I know what this is. He says, barefoot is a bridge. It's going to get people who are drinking beer and martinis to drink wine mm -hmm. in the first place. And I'm here with a big wine section. I'm trying to sell wine to people. They got to know what it looks like, what it tastes like, what the varietals are like. Mm -hmm. And they have, and it has to be at a price they can afford. And he says, Barefoot's perfect for that. So Wilford was a, a big uh, strategic ally for us on the front end of it. Oh, yeah. Drew, did you get PTSD after when you were listening to the audio book? Or? Part of it. Yeah, Ed, Ed, Ed was, he, he <laughs> his, his, his acting in there was, yeah, it was, it, there was a little PTSD going on for sure. For sure. I, but Michael, I really want to ask you, like in the, in the mid nineties, I remember that scarcity of wine and how you found such a creative solution to the, sourcing it from Chile. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, well, um, I'm sure a lot of people alive today don't realize that there was a time when we ran out of wine in California. And that happened in 1995 and even into 96. It was a wine drought, if you will. And so there was enough wine, you know, for the uh, for the more expensive wines that could pay, you know, the, the money for the bulk wine uh, or who were growing it themselves. But for players uh, at, at the fighting varietal level who were basically buying uh, or sourcing their wines uh, through bulk, um, it was tough. So we had a situation where uh, I, I had a wine uh, maker who basically uh, Bonnie and I were on vacation. We're over in Kalalau Valley on Kauai, running around on the beach, having a great time. We're over there for like two or three weeks. We come back. There's been no sales. And we go, what TF, you know, <laughs> what is this? And uh, the sales guys said, you know, well, you know, the winemaker told us to, to put the brakes on sales because we had to keep our head down. And if we did, we might get through this. That boggled my and mind. I said, and I said, you never put the brakes on sales. I said, those guys aren't going to sell as much as you want, no matter what you're doing. So how can you dare tell them to slow down? And so Bonnie and I looked at each other and we used our favorite four-letter word, next, <laughs> N-E-X-T. You know, it's, it's, it's hopeful. It means something better is coming, right? And it, it's, a, it's a positive step you can take. So we said next, which means we need a new winemaker. So I went out looking for a new winemaker and I called my friend. Mark Lyon, who was the winemaker down there at uh, Sebastiani at the time. And uh, I said, Mark, I said, I need a winemaker, you know, that's creative, can handle this wine drought. You know, what do you got? He says, well, he says, a couple of weeks ago, a woman came in here, a female winemaker, which was really rare in those days, let me tell you. Um, and uh, it's, it's all a rage today. But back then, there was like four of them at the most uh, in the whole industry. And so uh, Jennifer Wall, and he says, oh, yeah, he says, uh, this woman came in, you know, but the, the board of directors uh, thought she was too assertive. I said, get her over here. That's the person I'm looking for. I want somebody that's more assertive. And so she came over. We talked to her for five hours and, you know, we wound up hiring her. And uh, in the process of the interview, I said, well, what are you going to do about this drought? She said, somewhere in the world, they got too much wine. She says, right now. It's uh, it's in the Rhone Valley. They got way too much wine for red wine. And uh, in Chile, they got way too much white wine. 
I said, yeah, but their wines taste different. You know, uh, what are the, what are the buyers going to put us on the shelf, you know, with the foreign wines? No, no. She says, you're established, you know, barefoot is, you know, established as a California wine. And, uh, you know, you can, you can go ahead and put a foreign uh, product in here because what they're buying is the price point and the fun label and the, and the, and the, the, uh, the taste profile. And I said, well, you're going to make this taste like our wine? She said, I'm going to match it. Well, this particular woman had studied uh, biochem and was pre-med down at Santa Cruz, at, uh, at UC Santa Cruz. And so she didn't just look at wines and say, oh, this wine's got a problem. She said, I know what's wrong with this wine on a molecular level. And I know how to fix it. And fixing wines was a much, much tougher skill than making wines, especially when you were trying to make them taste like what you had in your wine library for the last five years. Mm -hmm. And so she did it and she was our winemaker and she wound up being one of the most awarded winemakers uh, in the industry and still is today. In fact, when we were acquired by EJ, uh, they hired her. Of course they did. And she was, she just continued to just knock them out. So we got the reputation of being a value wine, you know, uh, gold medal winner at uh, at the velocity price point. Mm-hmm. So like the velocity price point today would be like $9.99, but in those days it was like $5.99. So yeah, that was uh, quite a challenge overcoming that. We overcame it. Uh, we went down to Chile. We went over to France. We made lifetime friends. Uh, you know, we we bought from the farmers. It was It was really a kind of a gas. We, we learned some interesting stuff. I'm sure that uh, Drew would like to hear this. Like, for instance, I said, that South American wine, you know, it tastes like rotten socks. What the hell? You know, <laughs> can't put that on the market. She says, well, it's their bentonite. You know, they're not using American bentonite. I said, we're going to ship it down there. She says, no, what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to jack up the SO2 so it doesn't ferment. And we're going to, put it in a a big bladder bag and we're going to put the bladder bag in a container and we're going to bring grape juice that is preserved basically with SO2 in a container on a ship from Valparaiso Harbor up to Oakland. Mm -hmm. We're going to take that container. We're going to take it up to Hopland where they have a spinning cone filter that can take the SO2 out of it. And then we'll inoculate it here and we'll go through the wine process here. And I'm telling you, that Sauvignon Blanc, it was hard to tell that it wasn't California Sauvignon Blanc. So I learned a lot about winemaking. I didn't want to, but I did. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, for, for your wine aficionado listeners, they'll get a big kick out of that. Oh, that's a fascinating story. One and, of the, and, and an innovative solution. That's, it's amazing. And one of the things I wanted to talk about too, uh, Michael, is you know, and you talk about this in the book is the, just the sure grit, right. And and you embodied grit in so many ways throughout this journey, but there was one particular scene and uh, Drew knows what I'm talking about. I think it was in South Carolina. Oh yeah. Well, uh, and there's a clip in the book about this too, uh, but I'll give you a a short uh, soliloquy. Um, It doesn't matter if you're the president and CEO. Uh, What matters is whether or not the guy who is in control of the store lets your product into the store. That's what matters. Okay. And so it took me a long time to understand that. I thought, oh, you know, gold medal winner, $5.99, you know, this is this is a slam dunk. Uh Uh-uh. And you know what they want? A lot of them, a lot of them want attention. A lot of them want service. A lot of them want to feel important. And so if the president CEO comes over and uh, and makes the pitch personally, uh, they feel like, oh, this guy's going to show up again, or at least he's going to hold his distributors responsible, you know, for spoils and all the problems that retailers have. And so it's important to a retailer to have, you know, the person behind the product. So this particular day, I parked my car 
on the other side of this parking lot, which is what you're supposed to do, because if you park up front, you're done, because those spaces are are for are for for customers, and the buyer knows it, and he thinks that you're selfish and thoughtless about his business. So I'm gonna buy anything from you, right? So you're shot before you walk in the door. Uh, so on the other side of the lot, which is about a hundred yards from the door, and uh, this is South Carolina in the summertime, and it's like really hot and sweaty down there in the summertime. I'm telling you, you know. You got to change your shirt a couple of times a day when it's not raining. Well, this particular day, you know, they there was a cloud burst uh, right over my head. And I had in my hand a back card because I had learned that the way to sell this product was to show the retailer what kind of support you had to help him move it out of the store. Because now the retailer's mentality was very simple. I spent all this money for this place. I got security. I got janitor. I got people working here. You know, I got insurance. Uh, you're going to give me something that's going to be a barking dog and sit on my floor. I got a dust. Uh -uh. I'm only going to put stuff here that's going to move because I've got to make money with this huge investment. Investment. And it took me years to figure that out. But what I just gave you there is a little a little picture of retailer. Um, and so uh, I was going to show them this big sign we made, which was like four foot by four foot, uh, you know, or maybe five by five. It had a, a big foot on it, just a giant foot. That's all. OK, so the idea was put that up in the store and uh, people would go, what, you know, what's with the foot, right? And, uh, you know, the, and there, we'd go back there and there would be a stack of barefoot wine there. Um, and I was going to pitch him on that. But no, this big thunderstorm happens and this rain comes down in buckets and it fills my pockets and my socks. I mean, I've never seen rain like this. It's like, and then the wind picks up. When the wind picks up, I'm holding on to this sign and it's like a square rigger now. See, because it's blowing me around the parking lot <laughs> and I can't let go because I know it's going to wind up in another southern state. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, finally get in. And when I get in, they stop cash registers, everything. And uh, I'm dripping up in the front. And I've got this sign that by now is like beat up. And uh, <laughs> I hear over the microphone, wet mop up front. Just like that, you know, like you hear in the big, you know, grocery stores when somebody spills something. And uh, this guy, this, this, this really kind of like clean cut looking Southern guy comes up and he says, he says, now, boy, he says, I know you got something to sell me and I know you want to sell it real bad. <laughs> well, he bought, he was, he was the buyer. He was the local buyer for Piggly Wiggly. And he bought it. And as a result of our success there in Columbus, North Carolina, it went into all the Piggly Wigglies, which later were acquired by another company. But I mean, they had like 400 stores, you know, so and it was throughout the South. So it was a, it was a big hit, but uh, it was a drenching hit. Yeah. <laughs> Love it, Michael. Yeah, you've done so many innovative things, including putting the footsteps to the wine on the floor. Um, and I know, um, Drew and I were talking before we hit record here, um, and he had some questions about the business theater. Sure. Yeah. Tell me about how, how did that idea come about? It, it means we always struggle with conveying stories and helping businesses tell their stories. This is so innovative. Well, you know, Bonnie and I built the barefoot brand and it became, you know, a bestseller, uh, uh, you know, coast to coast. I think we were in like, uh, 4,000 stores. There's something crazy like that. Um, and, you know, it doesn't seem like much compared to what Ian J. Gallo's done with it these days. But for, you know, just a couple, you know, independent getting started, you know, to get up to 600,000 cases a year was a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, but along the way, you know, we, because we were independents, we didn't think like corporations think. So and corporations, they basically... Uh, are operating on the need to know basis. You know, they don't want to tell you they got a problem because you might, you know, head for the exit door uh, or look for another job, right? Or think that your security is at stake. But at Barefoot, we would tell people what our problems were who work for us and ask them for help. And we figured, well, you know, they got a financial interest in our company and, you know, they, they've worked here. They know it better than anybody else. And so we have a meeting 
uh, every quarter and we bring in the salespeople. Now, in our company, we believe that we only had two divisions. We had sales and sales support. That was it. So if you weren't in sales, you know, you were in sales support. It didn't matter whether, you know, you were the uh, uh, the president of the company or the winemaker or the accountant. You are working for sales, see, because without sales, there was no money to pay checks. And we would go bankrupt just like that. We knew it. But you see, when companies get big, they kind of forget that and they operate on the idea that they're going to get paid whether or not they're sales, see. Um, so today I work for some big companies and I try to explain that to them. <laughs> it sounds obvious, but, you know, it's a big wake up call for a lot of companies. Uh, but in the meantime, we're back there, you know, with this idea of, uh, you know, uh, know the need instead of need the need to know. So mm -hmm. it's exactly the opposite. So we're telling people our problems. So we do it by every quarter we bring in our salespeople and they show up on the screen and they say, you know, I'm down here in Florida, you know, I got good news and bad news, you know, okay, well, what's the good news, Jimmy? Oh, the good news is that we just got into Publix, you know, they got 600 stores, everybody, you know, starts throwing things around and they're cheering and carrying on. He goes, yeah, well, what's the bad news? Well, the bad news is they're only going to put us into, you know, a limited number of stores. And we have a limited number of months to sell a certain amount of product. And if we don't, we'll never get into the chain because this is a test. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. You know, well, and then there's the really bad news. Well, what's the really bad news? Well, they put us on the bottom shelf because we got to earn our way to the top. Okay. So one person says, well, I guess, I guess we'll just have to uh, go after the foot traffic, you know? So everybody laughs, you know, barefoot foot traffic, it's cornball humor. And so then uh, the next thing somebody else says, you know, that's not so crazy. Why don't we come up with some decals of footprints and we can lay them down. And this is before they were charging for floor space for, for point of sale material. And uh, let's lead people step-by-step step from the front door all the way to the wine aisle and then down the wine aisle and turn them to where our product was on the bottom. They'd already be looking down to see where the feet go and they'd see barefoot down there. We have our sign. And um, we thought, you know, that's kind of crazy, but we did it. We did it. We Hell, we did it all over Chicago. We did it in every state in the United States. We did these footprints. Uh, and we got away with it for about four years before the before the stores started to realize, well, we've got a valuable asset here. We should be selling it, see? Uh, and mm -hmm. then they oversold it, and then it disappeared. But you'll go into some stores uh, like Benny's in Chicago, and sure enough, the barefoot footprints will be there. Well, that idea was from our 78-year-old receptionist, Charlene. Now, did she need to know that problem? I mean, she wasn't qualified to make decisions, you know, in marketing or sales, but we included her. And because we did, we got that great idea. So to answer your question, Drew, these ideas that we got, they came from our own people. They came from the people that work for our distributorship. And a lot of them came from the people in the stores, you know, the clerks and whatnot. Mm -hmm. They would say, hey, you know, you guys should do this. And we would do it. <laughs> and then and then we would go back and thank him and tell him how many stores we were doing it in and all that. I want so to be, oh. go ahead, Drew. No, I was saying it's so great to have that collaborative spirit and be able to listen to everyone without having that sort of hierarchy where you have to go up the chain of command. You can just enact change so much quicker. Oh, yeah. And I think that that's really what saved Barefoot because, you know, the big boys were after us. You know, they would uh, take our uh, our little uh, reorder scan uh, tickets down because they knew it was too much trouble for the clerk. If he couldn't scan it, he wouldn't reorder it, which is very clever. Uh, or they turn it upside down, the clerk would see it, but it wouldn't register because he would always stroke it from one side to the other. Uh, or they would, you know, they would do things to us to try to, because they saw that Barefoot was exploding and they wanted to kill it. They were afraid that this would really, you know, catch hold in the country. And so what saved us is if we won uh, a wine contest, say in Los Angeles, within two days, we had our stickers on every bottle in Los Angeles in every store that said that we were the winner of the LA wine fair. That's amazing. And did the barefooters go put those stickers on? Everybody did. We all stopped and we went, Hey, let's, you know, I know you're selling in Minnesota, but get on a plane. 
time to put stickers on the bottles. <laughs> That's it. That's what you had to do. You know, it's like, it's the, the romance of the wine business has more to do with consumption and growing and terroir. But if you want to talk about the business of the wine business, it really comes down to merchandising. What do you look like in the store? Can your customers see you? Are you out of stock? Uh, all those kind of issues that are very unglamorous. You know, I, I say in the book, you know, I could have been selling hammers. <laughs> the one thing about merchandising that, you know, the you tell the story about the it needs to be viewable from four feet away. Today, with a lot of um, wine and e-commerce, the label needs to be recognizable in that little like 100 pixel image that you see on the, on the screen with all the bottles coming down. So that's that still rings true. Oh, yeah. It... Uh, it, it well, you know, we grew up with technology. We watched, you know, when we started Barefoot, uh, you know, we had push button phones and uh, and stuff like that. Uh, and we had computers that were huge. Uh, and and when we finally sold Barefoot, you know, we, we had all kinds of cool stuff, uh, you know, but just the the advance of broadband people people who are live today don't realize what a huge difference broadband made. Because now you could stream video to a phone or to a device. Mm -hmm. And that was just unheard of in the past. So everything that happened had to be, you know, in paper, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you had to like, you know, scotch tape paper signs up. And you know, it's funny today, those paper signs still work because people are going, you know, this, this is more real. You know, it's not just on my phone. Look at that. This mm -hmm. guy, the clerk said that he's tasted this himself and he actually likes it. <laughs> Michael, one of the things that really stuck out in your journey uh, is you were one of the pioneers of worthy cause marketing in wine. Now, you know, everyone is about mission. They're about mission driven social responsibility. You were doing that back when probably I don't know if anyone was doing it or most people were not doing it. So I'd love for you to talk uh, a little bit about some of the causes that you you helped along the journey. Oh, I would love to. Uh, but uh, first of all, your listeners might want to know how we came up with the idea. <laughs> yes. So it wasn't, you know, and I, I think, I think there's a clip in the book about this. But so one day I'm at the office. I got a telephone call. It's a guy with a very thick Chinese accent. I can hardly understand him. But he's saying, "Oh, you, Mr. Houlihan," he says, uh, "You're a very rich fella." You know, and I thought, geez, you have the right number. You know, <laughs> I don't I don't have any money. You know, I, I got people chasing me for money. He says, I'm doing a fundraiser, you know, in Chinatown in San Francisco. I'm trying to create a park, an after school park for kids after school, you know. Uh, and, and, you know, can you donate? We, all we need is fifty thousand dollars, you know, for swings, and slides and sandboxes and whatnot. And I said, you know, I, I don't have any money to help you. I, and I felt sorry for the guy. And I thought. I said, but you know what I do have is I have a lot of wine that I haven't been able to sell and I would be glad to give it to you, you know, for your fundraiser. And maybe, you know, you can use it, auction it off and buy some swings and slides or maybe it'll loosen some people up and write a bigger check, you know. And he goes, okay, okay, okay. So he takes the wine. I don't hear from him again, but I noticed that sales in the neighborhood of Chinatown are taken off. Mm. All the stores in the neighborhoods are, are taken off. And so we said, I wonder if that happened because the people who attended the fundraiser remembered our name, remembered our label, and went out and bought it when they saw it. And sure enough, we tried it in another neighborhood, you know, up in Twin Peaks. They were doing some kind of a, a, a creek cleanup up there. And so we donated wine, you know, for an environmental cause. Sure enough, same thing happened. And we thought, gee, this is great because... Remember what the guy said. He says, it's got to be a household word, you know, before I'll bring it into the chain store. And we thought, and we had no money for advertising. So we thought, why don't we use this as a form of advertising? And so we call it worthy cause marketing because we were marketing uh, our product by supporting worthy causes. And so Bonnie and I, we're, we're conservationists. You know, we're, she was born in Portland. I was born in San Francisco. So our whole life, we watched our cities just get infilled and, you know, the suburbs expand and the parks disappear. And, you know, we, we saw what was going on. Everything was getting concreted over in our lifetime. And so we became really ad, uh, advocates for conservation. And we'd been looking for ways to kind of weave that into the business. 
So one day I was in LA and this guy says, uh, you know, you're barefoot. He says, uh, have you guys ever thought about, you know, the Surfrider Foundation? I said, who are those guys? He says, oh, well, you know, they're surfers who are protecting the coast. They test the waters uh, for bacteria. You know, they do all this stuff. They got lawyers, they got scientists, you know, and they're raising funds to, to change laws and whatnot to protect the coast and the ocean. I said, sure, I'd love to talk. So I go down there and I talk to them. There's this, there's this scene in the book about this. Um, and, uh, you know, the guy, the guy looks like a surfer. I mean, you know, he's wearing uh, Karachi sandals, you know, and, uh, and, uh, you know, he's got a t-shirt on and he's got a surfboard up behind him. And I said, uh, I said, is this, uh, is this, uh, uh, is this surf rider foundation? He says, you got it. He says international world headquarters. And it was just a desk in him. <laughs> and so we helped him raise money for their task force in LA by educating our buyers about the dangers of the bacteria in the water that was due to cities and other government agencies actually dumping uh, in, into the very bay where their kids were playing in the water. And so the, and our, and our customer was basically a mom with two kids, 37 years old. And she, she was, you know, brought a, aware of this for the first time and she donated, so we raised money for them. And we thought, well, let's do this across the country. So we did it for like Save Delaware Bay and, you know, all kinds of different things up in the Rockies and you name it, uh, up in Oregon, down, down in uh, Florida. And uh, as a result, the members of that nonprofit organization now had a social reason to buy our product. It wasn't a mercantile reason. Now, we're because marketing the way we were doing it is different. We didn't just sell a pair of shoes and give a pair of shoes to some people in Africa, okay? Uh, we didn't uh, have a pink uh, uh, bow on our bottle that said, oh, we're supporting the American Cancer Society. You know, we're good guys. No, we weren't even talking to the general public. What we were doing was we were supporting the group in their fundraisers, actually hoping that their membership would buy our brand. So we weren't after the general public. We were after the membership of the nonprofit. It's a subtle little difference, but the thing is they're organized. They're organized. You know, they've got websites, they've got, uh, they're communicating with each other. Uh, and if we can, if we can convince them that we care about their cause, which we did, and they're going to choose a wine at our price point, they're more likely to choose the one that is being produced by one of their members. Mm. And so that's, that's how we did it. And uh, we got to a point where we could, we could afford uh, commercial advertising, but we chose to go with Worthy Cause Marketing because it was so much more effective. You have to remember these causes were in the neighborhoods right around the stores where our products were. And remember what the retailer wants. The retailer wants it to move, right? He doesn't really care what it tastes like very much unless you're Wilford Wong and you're trying to improve people's wine knowledge. But most of the supermarkets, they just want to move it. See, so what's going on in the neighborhood around that supermarket that we can get involved with and help? In Chicago, it was Little Sisters of the Poor. I remember that. In, um, so that grassroots effort, it's so powerful, the way that it just kind of bubbles up. What did wineries today, with that mission-driven kind of marketing system, what advice would you give a winery or a craft producer today who wants to engage in this worthy cause type of marketing? Well, I would say if you're going to donate wine, only do it at a fundraiser and only do it under certain conditions. Like for one thing, make sure that your wine and your label is visible so it's not being used just as a commodity behind the bar where people don't even know where it's coming from. In other words, don't let the nonprofit say, thank you very much, we'll use it. So mm. it's not a gift, you're actually marketing. See, so then the other thing too is you want to say, listen, we'd like to ask you several things that I'm sure that you can say yes to that aren't going to cost you anything. Like, you know, would you announce that we're your sponsor for the event and thank us at the end of the event? Would you do that? Oh, yeah, we can do that. How about this? Would you let us write a blog post, uh, you know, for your website, you know, about why we support your cause? So we become engaged in there. And then how about this one? Can we use your goals and your logo and put them on our bottles or products or whatever in the stores 
so that we can access a market that you can't access, which is the supermarket shopper. See, mm. so this is like this is like a new venue for them. And so by asking them those questions, oh, and here's the last one. Can we put a sheet of paper down between the fork and the knife at the dinner, the $300 a plate dinner, that is the 10 stores that carry our product that are within 10 miles of where you're sitting? See? And so the idea here is to really link and lever. So what happens with a lot of people in the wine business and in other businesses, and they mean well, is they think that half of them think, well, people are going to buy my product because I'm a good guy. And so they start bragging to the general public about what a good guy they are. Okay, but the other ones that are really trying to get the members of the nonprofits to buy their products, they think that they can do it by just giving it away. And no, you got to get in there and work. You have to, just like anything you got to make sure that they know who donated. And, you know, we would help them set up and break down from their events, you know, and they would, they would see us moving chairs around and they go, well, those guys, who are those guys? See? So that's what my recommendation would be is, you know, it's better. And also it's better to work locally than nationally. Mm. You know, you start working nationally, you know, you're going to be up against all the big companies. And, and not only that, but the big organizations are actually selling sponsorships, which startups and small craft breweries and whatnot, they can't afford. So the idea is to work local and support the groups that are local. You know, and when I say local, I mean local to your brewery, local to your winery and local to the stores where your products are for sale. Because your job is to get people to walk in the door of that store and buy that product. And once, once the retailer knows that that's what you're doing, he's going to stack it to the moon. Michael, I love that. And, um, you know, it's, it's so creative by just, you know, the creativity, but also just uh, employing things that the way you frame it is these things don't cost them any more money, right? No. Like, things they just announce, things that you can do for them. And I love that creativity um, as far as that goes. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, the next, you know, I really wanted to talk um, and kind of circle back to business audio theater and the your um, kind of the inception with that and what's going on with that currently and why, you know, you could do a million different things, all right? In, in the beverage space, the wine, anything you want to do, talk about business audio theater and what you're doing now and, and why business audio theater? Well, you know, after we built the, the brand and then after we sold the brand, uh, we wrote a book called uh, the, the Barefoot Spirit uh, and it became a New York Times bestseller. It was a paperback. And, you know, we went on, you know, the author tour, we, we authored, we went on, on tour around the United States and also around the country, I mean, around the world. Um, and we spoke at 60 schools that teach entrepreneurship. And after about, let's say about seven years ago, people started showing up wearing buds and earbuds, right? Uh, and it was all the, the rage about seven years ago. And about five years ago, Everybody was wearing them, you know, and we started saying, what are you listening to? Is it hip hop? Is it rock? What, what, what are you listening to? And they'd say, oh, no, I'm listening to War and Peace. The damn book's so thick. You know, this gives me an opportunity to, to, to piecemeal it out and I can I can read it. When, I mean, listen to it when I want. And I said, oh, that's interesting. What about you? Another guy. And he'd say, oh, he says, I'm listening to a podcast. You know, I figured I can better myself and my business, you know, and and, uh, you know, it's free and it's all good content. Um, and, and we started to realize that things were changing because of the technology. Um, and we said, let's us do an audio book. So we went down and we went down to, uh, to uh, Amazon, uh, to uh, Audible, and, and we bought the top 10 business audio books of the year from, audio, from, from uh, Audible. And we listened to them. And they were all great. And we learned stuff from every one. And it's just fantastic. It was a great experience. I highly recommend it because you can turn it on and off. And, you know, uh, a lot of young people, they like to speed it up. <laughs> but what's interesting about it was that they were all read to you. They were read to you by a narrator. So if you didn't like the narrator, you were stuck with them for seven hours. Um, 
one day we're driving across the Arizona desert, you know, on 10 between Phoenix and, uh, and uh, uh, Tucson. And here comes NPR, uh, National Public Radio, and it's uh, Guy Noir Private Eye on Prairie Home Companion. And this is a 1945 style radio theater show where they have like five or six actors that play all these parts and they have all these sound effects, you know, that they're making a door slamming car, starting all this stuff. And uh, then they have music that's live. That's like, you know, raising the tension, you know, like the shark is coming, bum, 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 that kind of thing. And we looked at each other and we went, this is a great way to teach business. And now Bonnie and I, because we were on the speaking tour, we had met so many other founders and we listened to their stories. And, and uh, you guys know this, after you talk to 10 or 15 founders, you start to realize that there is these common principles that they all subscribe to. Mm -hmm. And you start to hear them, the same principle applied in different verticals, you know, whether it's the aircraft industry, the medical industry, you name it. And you, you wind up having more in common with these people. And so we started developing friends who were founders and we were, you know, talking to them about what their biggest challenges were. And they said that their biggest challenge was finding the right people to work for them, holding on to those people so that after they trained them, they didn't lose them and um, engaging the right people so that they would, uh, suggest solutions and do more than just their paycheck. And we thought, you know, business audio theater works so well for the barefoot spirit because we had made the barefoot spirit and uh, the, uh, the uh, audio book producers association of America last year gave it a top five audio books of the year. So the business audio theater that we made of our own book. And we thought, let's do this for other people. And not let's just do this for other people, but let's do it as a kind of an HR tool, uh, you know, a human resources tool. So you go to work for this company, right? Can you identify with the company? You know, uh, you know, are they doing are they doing the right thing for the environment? You know, your kids are growing up in this environment. Uh, are they doing the right thing for women? Are they doing the right thing for uh, you know? Uh, inclusion, all of those kinds of issues that are big issues today. This is an opportunity for founders to tell their own private personal story about how they started their company. And, you know, they weren't born with spoons in their mouths. These people had to shovel, you know, what in the wind mm -hmm. for a long time before they finally got traction. And they built this big $400 million company where you now are a programmer making $200,000, $300,000 a year. So, why do you stay there? Well, it's because I was pulling for the hero who was the founder when he was up against the situation in his garage where the cops were knocking at the door and he didn't have the right license. And I'm pulling for him to get the loan, you know, from the bank so that he can go ahead and do this. And I'm pulling for him to uh, get this big buyer. Well, this pulling for thing is really identifying with. And that's what we did with Business Audio Theater. We thought, this is a great way to get the listener, those kids with the earbuds, right, to identify with the founder as a kind of a hero and to hear their story and to realize that these people have been humiliated too. And they're not that different than you. And they've been up against a lot of problems in their life and they had to overcome them. And, you know, imaginatively or, you know, uh, maybe just by, you know, grit sticking to it, you know, for 25 years, whatever. So that is why we did it. And, uh, you know, we're offering that to other founders today. What a, what a great service. One of the um, that radio theater, it really sticks in your mind. And what it does is it really it, it lasts long after you listen to it one of the one of the theater pieces in your book you you're at the horse races and i i've got to ask the question what was your backup plan if shabby shoes didn't win <laughs> well that was the situation where we saw the buyer down on the finish line and uh he asked us who who we should who we should bet on and i said you know bonnie always bets on some uh, something that has to do with feet 
because we're barefoot. And so here there's a 30 to one, you know, long shot here, you know, shabby shoes. And he goes, I'm putting all my money on shabby shoes. You know, if you guys win, you know, I'm going to give you mandatory stacks in all of my stores. He says, and if you lose, you know, you're getting discontinued. <laughs> so, you know, I didn't know if he was telling me the truth or serious or whatever, but I never rooted so hard for a nag in my whole life. And it won. And we did get the stacks, but I mean, yeah. So stuff like that, it's very human. It's very, you know, real. And it does stick with you. Uh, you know, the thing about the imagination, and this is why I like radio. This is why I like podcasts. It's because it's experiential learning. You're, you're involved. You know, if somebody says, you know, Jim came into the office and pulled up a chair, well, you have an image of what Jim looks like. You pull it out of your head. You have a chair. You pull that out of your head from your memory. You have an idea of an office. You pull that out of your head from your memory. Well, guess what? Pulling all this stuff out of your head, the props that are needed to make that video go in your mind, is you being involved in telling the story. Mm -hmm. And that's why you, you smell the plumeria and you say, oh, yeah, that's the first thing I smelled when I got off the plane in Hawaii, you know, or whatever. It's because the way our brains work is we remember stuff by the energy that we put into the milestone, the, 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 the touchstones in our brain. You know, like the touchstone is the chair or whatever, or grabbing the chair. So it's really interesting how the brain works. And, and we, when, we, when we did the Barefoot Spirit in Business Audio, I mean, uh, the people who uh, who work for our, our, the current owners started listening to it. And they went, this is a great onboarding tool. And we went, yeah, maybe this is where we should think about pushing this business. Mm -hmm. So you know, we, we decided to do that. And they would say things like, you know, I remember these concepts because I remember the story in which the concept was used, as opposed to somebody saying, now, here's our manual. And here's the concept of how we handled this situation. See, and it's just so dry. And it's just like, it's a list, you know, most business books are written, like, here's the five things you got to do the 10 things to never do the 20 things your customer wants from you. Hell, you're sound asleep on number three. <laughs> you know, you're supposed to remember all that stuff. I don't think so. So, yeah. so anyway, let's 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 tell them a good old fashioned, uh, you know, story uh, and make it a cliffhanger, uh, and uh, you know, uh, add a lot of humility and and uh, you know, reality, and and maybe people will like it. Maybe they'll stick around. Maybe they'll want to work for you. Yeah. Now, Michael, do the business owners, do they have to have their book already produced or does business audio theater help them create, create and craft the story? We can do it both ways. If they already have a book, we can turn it into an audio play. Mm. Okay. We have a complete, we have a group in Los Angeles, uh, Sherwood Players uh, Productions. Uh, Matt Wineglass down there does a fantastic job of, uh, of, of taking taking this written script and bringing it to life with the actors and the sound effects and the music and all that stuff. But yes, if the person doesn't have a book, we work right with them. We're working with the client right now, who is one of the fathers really of telemedicine. You know, one of the, the person that actually applied telemedicine the first time, you know, we went from T1 lines to uh, broadband. Uh, but when we had T1 lines, he already was able to go into hospitals and be by your bed, even though he was in Colorado and somebody else was in LA that just fell off their bike. And so they get the best doctor, you know, in the country to look at their head. See, how did you do that? you know, in 2004, you know, you did it with a T1 line, see, because there was, you know, there was no, there was no broadband, but he did it. So we're writing his story. We're really excited about it. Uh, you know, we're engaged in it. Um, and, uh, you know, we're writing a play and it has scenes. Mm -hmm. And instead of somebody just telling you the story, you're actually witnessing the story. And I mean, it has ups and downs and curves. So yeah, we so in that case we're actually writing the play directly so there's no book now could you write a book from the play yes you could you could publish the play go the other way around you could yeah you could go the other way around michael i have uh first of all thank you i mean the journey the story is is truly uh amazing iconic um i have one last question and before i ask it 
I just want to point people towards uh, the best places online they can learn more. Um, so I know they can check out businessaudiotheater.com and learn more there. You should check out definitely the best selling book, The Barefoot Spirit How Hardship, Hustle, and Heart Built America's Number Wine, Number One Wine Brand. You could, you know, check it out on uh, Amazon, Audible. Um, I obviously, Drew and I recommend the Audible version, of course. <laughs> Um, and also you can check out the barefoot spirit.com. Are there any other places, Michael, online we should point people towards? Well, you know, most people who have smartphones, they like to have all their books on one platform. Maybe it's uh, iBooks, uh, you know, maybe it's Google. It's on all of those platforms and it's on every platform pretty much in the world. You can find the barefoot spirit audio play. Uh, so, yes, I, I would recommend that they go there. And also, uh, if, if they want to find out more about Bonnie and I and what we're up to, uh, it's at uh, www.thebarefootspirit.com. And uh, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we'd love to see you. And uh, please follow us. Thanks. Nice. Last question, Michael. You're a wealth of knowledge. The book is amazing. I would love to hear some resources or some of your favorite books, um, uh, business books that you learn from? Oh, boy. Well, I can tell you, uh, there's a book called As a Man Thinketh, which was written back in the 1920s, and it is so true today. There's another one called Think and Grow Rich. Highly recommend that one. Okay, it's really good. It's an interview with the successful people around the world, including Gandhi, including, you know, Henry Ford. Uh, and it's an interview where, like I said earlier, that everybody that the successful people have similar principles. Well, when you hear Gandhi telling you something that comes right out of Henry Ford's mouth, you know, you go, oh, my God, you know, this is this must be true then. Um and uh, so I recommend that. And, and then uh, how to win friends and influence people. Now, these are the three Bibles of American business in my book. Uh, they all the other books, you know, Tony Robbins, all those other guys, you know, everybody who's written since then, they are basically quoting these three books. But it's always good to go back and read these books the way they were written. So it's Think and Grow Rich as a Man Thinketh and uh how to how to make friends and influence yeah. very good books that's very, one of my favorites dale carnegie for sure oh yeah. mm -hmm. excellent excellent so i highly recommend that and uh you know that they they influenced me don't get me wrong i listened to tony robbins i listened to zig ziglar i listened to all those people who had tapes in the old days you know you used to put a tape into your dashboard and hope your dashboard wouldn't eat the tape <laughs> <laughs> it was before smartphones <laughs> I had many audio cassette tapes and I had those same ones. So Michael, I want to be the first one to thank you, Drew. Um, thank you for helping me. And, and Drew is the true wine guru out of the two of us by uh, a long shot by 10 football fields. Um, so I, we appreciate you. Everyone should check out more episodes of both our podcasts. Check out businessaudiotheater.com and thebarefootspirit.com. And Drew... Michael, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks for listening to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. We'll see you again next time, and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.